I was privileged yesterday to hear Terry talk at the U3A. He stole half of the things I was going to talk about tonight. <laughs> Never mind. The theme for this evening's uh, sermon, a uh, ramble, is um, uh, going to be all about uh, the médecin malgré lui, the doctor in spite of himself. A tale of two cities or a tale of two pseudo-doctors, I will call them. The text is taken from the Gospel according to Winston Churchill. He said, men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. <laughs> First of all, we'll start in Paris with this man, Pocalin. You probably didn't know the name Pocalin, but that was his real name. I'm sorry. The microphone is only for the purpose of the recording. It doesn't come over the speakers. Do you want to come forward? <laughs> I'll talk a bit louder. Pocalin took the stage name of Moliere. He followed, he was a little bit after Shakespeare, as you can see. The French consider him one of their best playwrights. He wrote comedies with a sort of satirical edge. And one of his better known ones was called, by the same title as I've given this talk, Le Médecin Malgré Louis, the doctor in spite of himself. And just very briefly, and you'll see why in a moment, uh, I want to talk about um, uh, that particular play. The play centers around an uh, illiterate woodcutter who was a terrible fellow, beat his wife and was always drunk and so on. And she was looking of ways that she might get rid of him. And one day she heard two men speaking as they went past her cottage. And they were saying how the lord of the manor couldn't find a doctor to treat the daughter who was ill. And she suddenly had an idea and she rushed after them and said, my husband is a doctor, he's a famous doctor, but he won't... Uh, admit to it unless you beat him a bit and you'll find him in the woods over there. So they found the woodcutter and they said, you're a doctor, we want you immediately to come to the manor house. And he protested, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a doctor. And they said, oh yes you are, we know you are. And they proceeded to beat him up and eventually he got a bit sick of that and said that he was a doctor. And so he was taken to the manor house where he successfully treated the daughter of the Lord of the Manor, who didn't have very much wrong with her at all anyway. That's one of the uh, lines from, uh, not from this play particularly, but just one of the better known lines from Moliere. But the woodcutter found that being a doctor had certain advantages, particularly in the days before stethoscopes. And I think that young lady's got quite a nice expression on her face, but you probably didn't notice that. I thank Terry for the picture. It comes from a recruiting poster for the medical school, apparently. <laughs> but the satire came because Moliere was very conscious of the fact that the doctors of the day had no idea what they were doing, basically. They were very happy to take payment uh, for their treatments. And if the patient didn't get better, well, it was the patient's fault and not the doctor's fault. And he wrote these lines here, and I apologize that it's a bit of a big uh, lot of reading, but I think you can read it slowly. He pointed out that uh, the doctor got paid whether the patient got better or not. So Scunarola, who was the name of the woodcutter, found that he could mix up a few herbs in bottles and so on and say they were medicine treat people and it was a lot easier than chopping wood. Now that sort of thing doesn't go on nowadays, of course. People don't buy things that are not tried and tested. Or do they? I was in the chemist shop the other day waiting for something and I just happened to notice a display of 
bottles of pills for arthritis. I can't remember the name, but I picked one up to see what was in it. Ingredient, crushed eggshells. That was the sole ingredient. $30 a bottle. <laughs> So this sort of pseudo-doctor found that he could uh, practice quite well as a doctor in those days, and um, uh, it, was, it was a very good life for him. Now, I think Jeff Cutfield is not here tonight for this. Uh, not Jeff Cutfield, I'm sorry, Tony Yelovich, I beg your pardon. This is on the pavement in Clyde, central Otago, and it's about a man, and I think you can read it. Joseph Stevens, he was headmaster at the school. His wife Dora was assistant mistress. He was a lay preacher, secretary of the hospital board, and an anaesthetist and a dentist as well. And he had no training in either of those specialties whatsoever. <laughs> so that was even after anaesthesia had become a, a fact of life. Um, people didn't necessarily need to be qualified to do that. So I'm going to move on to the second pseudo-doctor, this man, Humphrey Davy, probably a slightly flattering portrait of him. He was described as being small, uh, with dark hair, and rather an intelligent looking face. And I'm just going to go back a little bit into his history. There were three young, young sisters called Millet, the surname was Millet. And they were orphaned at an early age when their both parents died of a fever, as people did in those days. And the three girls were taken in by a man called John Tobin, who was in the town of Penzance in Cornwall, uh, who was a surgeon apothecary. That'll become a bit more obvious what the importance of that is later on. Now, the eldest of these three sisters was called Grace Millet, and she married a Robert Davy. Now, Robert Davy was apparently quite a likable sort of chap. He was a bit of a dreamer and a bit of a drinker, and he made a bit of a living as a wood carver and gilder. I suppose he made, among other things, picture frames. Uh, interestingly, in, many years later, when Humphrey Davy became famous, he went to Paris, and when he came back, people said, did you go to the Louvre? Oh, yes, I went to the Louvre. Well, how was the Louvre? Well, he said, I've never seen so many lovely picture frames. <laughs> the father, Robert Davy, wasn't particularly interested in ensuring that his son had a good education, but Grace was. Grace was very insistent that he went to school, which wasn't compulsory in those days. And... Uh, the three girls were taken in by this man, John Tobin, the surgeon apothecary, who became godfather to the children. Humphrey Davy was the eldest of five children. There were three girls, and then finally a little brother for him called John, who did actually become a doctor, and he became a military surgeon, and he also became the first biographer of, of his elder brother, Humphrey. Now, Humphrey didn't shine at school particularly, but ah, there you, there you are. You can see here when he was born in Penzance. Penzance, coastal town in Cornwall, centred on fishing and also on the tin mining industry, which is of some significance, as we'll see. Robert Davy, the father, died fairly young. And uh, suddenly, Davy, who'd been wandering through school, not putting his mind to anything very much, suddenly realised that he was going to have to pull his socks up a little bit. Oops. This is a page from his, one of his school books, which is interesting. It's, uh, we don't need to go into it too much, but it's just a simple ge geometry problem. But you can see that while he was solving the problem, he also had time to draw some caricatures, presumably of his teacher, but I don't know, or maybe a fellow classmate. And you can see quite a lot of working with logarithms and so on to solve the problem. 
in his school books. He spent a lot of his time wandering about the countryside and swinging on farm gates and, uh, and fishing. He took up fishing at an early age and became a very keen fisherman and remained so for the rest of his life. And we'll come back to that a little bit later on. And he also started writing poetry because this was the age of the great romantic poets, Wordsworth and uh, Coleridge and Keats and Shelley and so on. And this is one of his poems that he wrote when he was quite, just not long after the, his father died. He called it the Sons of Genius, and he often referred to himself as a genius. Uh, people thought sometimes that he was a bit arrogant about it, to be honest. Some of his poems were reasonably favourably received, but he thought, uh, this won't do, I must... Uh, uh, discipline myself a bit more and, and learn something that's going to help me. 200 years after he wrote his famous book on nitrous oxide, a meeting was held uh, as a sort of bicentenary, and in it is reproduced a page from his notebook, and he wrote down, these are the things that I must do. It's the same age as he wrote this poem. I must learn more about theology, about geography, botany, pharmacy, can't read his writing very well, neurology, uh, chemistry, surgery, logic, languages, English, French, Latin, Greek, Italian, Spanish, and Hebrew. He's going to set himself the task of learning all those languages. Physics, the doctrines and property of natural bodies, the operations of nature, and so on. A whole page that he wrote for himself that he must improve himself in that way um, since his father had died. His father had inherited a small bit of land, but it had to be sold when he died. Uh, Grace, the mother, moved back into Penzance town and uh, took in lodgers and started a little millinery shop and they employed a young lady who uh, was from the Vendée region in France and it said uh, that Davy took French lessons with her and he said to his younger brother it was a dangerous time of my life I have yielded to the allurements dot 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 and it's not quite clear what he meant by that but uh, one might imagine There's been lots written about Humphrey Davy, as you might well imagine, and this is just one that was written quite recently. I haven't read it, but uh, it's available. You can still get it on Amazon. And I'd like just to put Davy's life in sort of perspective historically. Um, I put the Royal Society at the top because that figures quite largely later on, and that goes right back to 1660, the time of Charles II. But moving ahead a little bit, uh, we come to the era of the uh, Industrial Revolution. Now, it's not got a definite sort of starting date, but one of the things that started off some of the things was Jethro Tull with his seed-sowing machine. And this um, uh, helped to sort of improve agricultural practice, I suppose. I'll come back to this table in a moment or two, but... Uh, just to remind you, the Royal Society uh, has a very rather nice motto, I think. Take nobody's word for it. My father was an agriculturalist, and in the 1940s, he wrote a little booklet called Revolution in Agriculture. And I rather like the rather tatty sort of dust jacket that's on my copy of it now. <laughs> the old farmer the ghost of the old farmer, as it were, seeding the fields by hand out of a basket or a bag or container of some sort, just throwing the seed like that, and how things have changed with mechanisation of farming. That was the uh, seed-sowing machine of Jethro Tull. The start, I think, of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was largely founded on coal. 
And this graph shows, you probably can't see it exactly, but the rapid rise in the uh, production of coal to fuel the Industrial Revolution. And England led the way. It probably led the way a bit because uh, there were developing a lot of sort of age of enlightenment, they called it, the free thinking people who wanted to get away from some of the religious dogma that held things back. And if you compare England in the last decade, I wonder if this works, the last decade here in England with the next 10 years in Italy, you can see how far behind they were in terms of coal. They were still in Italy at that decade there, about the same as England was back in the 1500s in terms of horse, horses and manual labour and so on. And this again shows the level of industrial uh, action and you can see the, the UK right at the top there, well ahead of many of the other countries, Italy are way down the bottom. The population grew rapidly as well. This graph is a little bit uh, artificial by the time scale on the bottom being cramped up the way it is, but with the Industrial Revolution came improvements in health and improvements in food production and all sorts of things, and the population of the world just skyrocketed from that time onwards. So that was the sort of scene around about the time that Humphrey Davy was born. I've just put up at the top there after Jethro Tull because of the importance of coal mining to the Industrial Revolution uh, you needed, there were two problems with coal mining, flooding and explosions and we all know about Pike River and Newcomen who was an engineer from uh, Dorset invented the first real steam engine wasn't a steam engine as we would know it exactly. Uh, it was called an atmospheric engine, and I won't go into it too much, but uh, it basically, a large beam went up and down, didn't have any revolving parts, but it was able to pump water out of the mines. And the other problem with the mines, the explosions, of course, was what led Davy later on, way down, whoops, sorry, way down the bottom, uh, to develop the miner's lamp. The problem of what was called fire damp. It's always seemed to me to be a slightly strange word. You don't think of damp things burning, but the word comes from the German word dampf, meaning uh, vapour. So it was burnable vapour, really, is what fire damp means. I put Culloden in there just to say that things weren't uh, still sorted out from the point of view of uh, religious differences and religious tolerance and so on. And then 1765, there was formed in Birmingham a society called the Lunar Society. And the members met once a month at the time of the full moon because in the absence of street lighting, it was hard to get home in the dark. So they hoped that the full moon would be able to light their way home and they called themselves lunatics. Uh, Prominent among the lunatics were people like Priestley, who we'll talk about later on, uh, James Watt, um, and various other uh, free-thinking sort of people who uh, were trying to get away from some of the religious dogma of the time. They met in Birmingham. A little while later, a man called Arkwright invented the spinning machine uh, initially called the Arkwright's water frame because they were driven by water wheels, which was all very well as long as you had a free-flowing stream of water, but if the river dried up for any reason, it wouldn't work. Um, but Arkwright's spinning machine started the development of factories instead of having cottage industries. American Revolution started and then Davy was born. What improved on... Newcomen's engine, and just a little piece of knowledge, the dollar sign was invented that year. <laughs>
18, uh, 1783 what made an engine that turned a wheel. And once you had a revolving engine, you could drive machinery with belts or shafts or gears or whatever. And so factories began springing up, these rows and rows of spinning machines and weaving machines and so on, taking work away from the people who laboured in their cottages with spinning wheels and so on. And as you know, it led later on to the Luddite riots. Just as the development of the thrashing machine for getting the seed out of the corn, uh, driven initially by horses and then later on by steam engines, um, was further doing away with farm labour. And the farm labourers didn't like it and they, like the Luddites, they started these riots called the Swing Riots after their uh, mythical sort of hero called Captain Swing. Uh, it's thought to be reference to the flails that were used before the thrashing machines for getting the seed out of the corn. Both the Luddite riots and the swing riots were very harshly put down by the government and several of the ringleaders were hanged and several suffered an even worse fate, they were sent to Australia. I put in the birth of John Snow just because he uh, was an important person and regarded by some as the greatest physician of all time and then uh, carrying on like that. Now, John Tonkin, going back to the surgeon apothecary, uh, suggested that Davy become apprenticed to an apothecary, and he was apprenticed to a senior apothecary in Penzance called Bingham Borlase. He doesn't figure much in the story, but uh, Humphrey Davy thought that he would study medicine. He started off as an apprentice to an apothecary, and he actually explored the possibility of going to Oxford uh, or Cambridge, and he did actually get accepted to Jesus College in Cambridge, but he never took up the, the offer. Uh, he was reading you know, prodigiously at this time, reading everything he could get his hands on, and was a highly intelligent fellow, and he came under the influence of this interesting man called Davies Gilbert. Davies Gilbert was described as a, a politician, a bit of an engineer, a bit of a scientist, uh, and he did become, as you can see, president of the Royal Society, actually after Humphrey Davy was president of the Royal Society. Davies Gilbert uh, was interesting in that he was a speaker of the Cornish language, which even by that time was dying out uh, quite rapidly. He spoke and wrote in Cornish, uh, and he befriended Humphrey Davy and gave him access, gave Davy access to his library of books. And they would often go for walks together and discuss all sorts of philosophical questions. Giddy had studied at Oxford under this man, Thomas Beddoes. He was a professor of chemistry at Oxford, and he was described as a short, fat, asthmatic sort of man. We'll talk a bit more about him later on. But he was a very popular lecturer at Oxford, and he would have gone on to greater things at Oxford had it not been for his politics. Horrors, he was a Democrat. He believed in uh, public health systems and the government funding things and so on. And he was also an atheist, and uh, he was also a supporter of the French Revolution. So all those things conspired to mean that he couldn't carry on at Oxford. And he left Oxford and went to Bristol, where he decided he would build a hospital for treating people free of charge. And he decided that, uh, I don't know quite why, but he had the idea that maybe by breathing different forms of gas and so on, you could treat various diseases. <laughs> 
And so he set up what was called the Pneumatic Institute. Now, Giddy, who'd been his pupil at Oxford, uh, said, I know a man who might be interested to help you. He's a very bright young man. He's currently studying to be an apothecary. And so introduced Humphrey Davy to Thomas Biddows. There you can see he was at a place called Hot Wells, which was a spa town n near um, Bristol, but now actually in the greater Bristol area. The, the, the famous romantic poets start to sort of enter the scene at this point. Coleridge, Wordsworth, Southey, De Quincey, and so on. And like poets everywhere, even today, I suspect, they were not averse to exposing themselves occasionally to mind-altering substances of one sort and another. And Coleridge became actually quite uh, badly addicted to opium. Now, Beddoes did have funny ideas. He had an idea that uh, the breath of cows would prevent you from getting tuberculosis. And so in his hospital, a little hospital that he'd constructed, the Pneumatic Institute, he had a whole bar full of cows. Uh, the, the, the breath of the cows was directed into the area where the patients were, and he thought this would help them. Later on in life, he said this, which I thought was quite interesting. Family health would be improved if wives were provided free of charge with anatomy lectures, I'm not quite sure why, but also washing machines, fresh vegetables, and pressure cockers. Beddoes was short of funds. He, uh, he did think that um, he could sell equipment for administering gases to the wealthy who were often ill and he, he thought they would buy his equipment and the equipment was designed by another friend of his, James Watt, that we'll have a bit more to say about shortly. But he was always after, after funds and um, he applied to Sir Joseph Banks of Banks Peninsula uh, who was president of the Royal Society at the time for funds but Banks wasn't, was, was not inclined to make funds available to someone who was treating people uh, or subjecting patients to experiments uh, with, with no sort of uh, uh, realisation of the, whether there was going to be a good outcome or a bad outcome and so on. So they were sort of experimental patients, experimental treatments on patients. And also, Beddoes was rather critical of the Royal Society because he said the Royal Society... Uh, elected its members on the colour of their political opinions. And of course, Beddoes himself was uh, of a very different political opinion to most of the people who got into the Royal Society. However, it was through uh, this uh, applications to Joseph Banks that Banks got to hear about Humphrey Davy. Um, Banks, uh, sorry, Beddoes, uh, when he was uh, uh, applying for money to the Royal Society, uh, enlisted the help of various people, including James Watt, the engineer, and also the, the Duchess of Devonshire, his name was Georgiana. Now, she was a very exuberant, flamboyant lady about town, uh, but she was very unhappy privately. Her husband uh, didn't love her. The husband had actually taken her best friend as his mistress, and she herself, Lady uh, the Duchess of Devonshire, was a terrible gambler and ran up debts that amounted to about four million pounds in today's money. So uh, she, she wasn't really in much of a uh, position to help fund the Pneumatic Institute. Davy was offered the position of superintendent uh, and so he got freed from his um, uh, apprenticeship as an apothecary and went to work at the Pneumatic Institute and started studying various gases. Now, we have to just backtrack a little bit. 
Um, oh, Coleridge, I mentioned, the rhyme of the ancient mariner and others. Um, James Watt. Another person who put money into the Pneumatic Institute was Wedgwood, the potter, or the maker of uh, ceramics. You notice the wigs. In those days, uh, Pitt, I think it was, desperate for money to, to fund the Napoleonic Wars, put a tax on wig powder, because the men who wore wigs used to powder their wigs to make them look nice and white. I don't think it was a very popular tax. We go back a hundred years or so to this man, because everybody would normally say Priestley was the person who discovered oxygen. This man, a hundred years before Priestley, called John Mayo, uh, was also a fellow of the Royal Society, as you can see, and he did research that um, was later repeated by Priestley. Sorry for the rather large slide, but I hope you can read it, that he found out you put an animal in a glass uh, container, the animal eventually died, and the level of the water in the container would rise up, indicating that something in the air had been removed by the animal. Priestley did similar experiments a hundred years later, but Mayo is not a name that's so readily known. This is Priestley. He's been described as a priest who had a hobby of chemistry. He belonged, he was one of the English founders of the Unitarianism uh, sect, which had started in Poland, apparently. I don't know a lot about it, but it was a dissenting Protestant sect. It got him offside with a whole lot of people, and um, uh, it, because he... he proselytized a bit, I suppose, uh, but he was a clever chemist, uh, clever at his hobby, but his priestly endeavors got him into trouble with uh, people generally who didn't uh, like that sort of uh, getting away from the standard church doctrine. He made a lot of discoveries, uh, but he got very hung up on this question of phlogiston, and uh, so he called oxygen dephlogisticated air. I'm not don't have time to go into the whole story about it. You can read about it. It was a very strange thing that got stranger and stranger. But Priestley hung on to this doctrine for the whole of his life. But he made an interesting statement. I think he said he couldn't help flattering himself that in time medicinal use might be made of the application of these different kinds of airs. Up till that time, people thought air was just air. They didn't believe that it consisted of different things. And the same applied to water as well, that water was just water and not made up of different elements. <coughs> and here's a cartoon of the time. You probably can't read it, but it said, uh, Dr. Phlogiston, the priestly politician or the political priest. And he's stamping on the Bible and waving tracts and so on, and that didn't go down well. And uh, mobs actually attacked his house and set fire to it, and he fled to America. He was friends of um, the founding father fellow. Franklin. Thank you, Ben Franklin, exactly. <laughs> now, th these are a couple of statements made by Humphrey Davy when he started working at the Pneumatic Institute that, first of all, he said mental problems, including pain, might be cured by drugs or gases. And then his more famous statement that all anaesthetists have heard of was that he thought nitrous oxide is capable of pain, may be used with advantage during surgical operations. And that was in 1799, nearly 50 years before anaesthesia. And uh, I can sort of imagine uh, someone going and saying they wanted to have an operation. And I said, well, there's a waiting list, I'm afraid. It's 50 years, you know. And they, oh, it's as bad as waiting for a total hip. But um, the problem 
that people have said, and I uh, trying to say Humphrey Davy was a pseudo doctor, what people have often wondered, had Humphrey Davy been a proper doctor, he might have uh, cottoned on earlier to this idea that it could something could be given to prevent the pain of surgical operations. And I read just recently what this long delay, the nearly 50 years between 1799 and 1846, which is the, the date from which anesthesia really took off, although there'd been, there had been some earlier attempts, partially successful before that. 1846 was the American dentist in Boston called Morton, who gave a successful demonstration of ether. The problem is that we look at it with our eyes, we think it's unimaginable that you could chop someone's leg off or do some other operation uh, without anaesthetic. There's a very famous lady called Fanny Burnett, who in, I think, about 1811, had a breast amputation for cancer without any anaesthetic whatsoever. And she wrote a 10,000 word diary about it afterwards. She lived for a further 20 years after the surgery, but it must have been a terrible experience. But in those days, there were various reasons why people didn't think very much about relieving pain of surgery. Part of it was to do with religious doctrine, uh, that, uh, that pain was uh, something sent by the Almighty, perhaps, or um, something that man had to suffer. And uh, this statement was in a paper I read recently that it was seen as not necessarily something which should, even if it could, be avoided. In the American Civil War, which started in 1861, and anesthesia was already 15, 20 years old, some of the officers refused to allow the men to have anesthesia if they needed to have their wounded leg chopped off or whatever it was because it would weaken their strength that if they didn't, you know, couldn't face having a leg chopped off, how could they possibly face the enemy sort of thing? And when uh, chloroform was used first in Edinburgh in childbirth, the church became very angry and said the Bible states that women shall uh, bring forth children with sorrow or something. And uh, fortunately, uh, other people begged to differ, and one of them was Queen Victoria, who said, we are having the child and we shall have chloroform. <laughs> I just want to go back for a moment to Galileo. Galileo was one of the people that would have been a welcome member of the Lunar Society had he been around at the time because he had divergent views from that of the church. And I'm sure you all realise that... Excuse me. Um, he was right and they were wrong, but they wouldn't see that they were wrong. And uh, he said that as well, which is, I thought was quite nice. When he died, the Duke, I think it was the Duke or the, somebody in um, that part of Italy, wanted to have a big tomb for him in the Basilica of Santa Croce in, in Florence, and the Pope refused permission because Galileo had been uh, accused of heresy, suggesting that the, the earth revolved around the sun and not the other way around. Eventually... They did make a tomb for him there. I must confess I haven't seen it, but um, an elaborate tomb. But when he was dug up and put in this new tomb, someone pinched his finger, one of his, what was left of one of his fingers, and that is on display in the Museo Galileo in Florence, and I have been there. Pepys, in his diary, about that same time in 1660, uh, said these words, or wrote these words. 
people didn't have a sort of humanitarianism in those days. Public executions were spectacles to be gone and, uh, you know, ogled at. And um, Pepys was fairly factual in saying that just poor fellow looked uh, as happy as one could in the circumstances and so on. <laughs> sort of seems incredible these days. Going back to Davy again, after he'd been at the Pneumatic Institute uh, for a little while, a couple of years, um, he, uh, because of his, uh, Sir Joseph Banks got to hear of him and suggested that he move to London. But in the meantime, he had experimented with nitrous oxide uh, and had in 1799, that's, that's a picture of Davy in later life, he became rather arrogant and irritable, apparently. But he, he was awarded the Copley Medal, uh, and that's been going ever since uh, 1753. And I, I've just picked out a few people whose names would be well known. Some of the other names were not well known to me, but there's Davy there, Priestley earlier, um, and you see right up to the present day. Some people would say that Davy was the uh, most preeminent chemist of all time, <laughs> certainly in uh, discovering new elements and purifying them and so on. He, all of those things uh, were first discovered by Humphrey Davy. Going back just a little bit, uh, when, when he was working at the Pneumatic Institute, he read a paper by this man, Mitch Hill. Mitch Hill uh, was an American, but he had been educated in Edinburgh, and he had an MD. He had some very funny ideas. Uh, he uh, wanted to rename the United States of America Fredonia. <laughs> That didn't catch on, but it did catch on in the case of one small village. I think it's in Pennsylvania, but I could be corrected on that. But Fredonia uh, was interesting in that it was the first place where they got natural gas out of the ground by putting a hole in the ground. Um, and quite a long time ago, before they had steel pipes, they had pipes made out of wood that were proofed with uh, tar-covered uh, sacking. He developed this funny theory of disease and he developed particularly the idea that nitrous oxide was fatal. He called it septon and he thought it was the basis of all uh, infections and that if you were to breathe nitrous oxide you would die very quickly. Well, it's true I suppose if you breathe pure nitrous oxide for long enough you'll suffer from lack of oxygen. But um, he did go off on a funny uh, sort of tangent, Mitch Hill. And Davy subsequently wrote in 1799, I've made a discovery that nitrous oxide is respirable when freed from nitric oxide, uh, which you do by bubbling the gas through water. And it appears to support life longer than common air. I don't know why it would appear to do that. I think he was wrong there. Uh, but he said Dr. Mitchell's theory of contagion is completely open. <laughs> and Davy formed the idea that nitrous oxide uh, would have all sorts of uses. And he wrote this uh, quite substantial book, which is, strangely enough, still available online. You can look it up. You can uh, download it even uh, on nitrous oxide. He still wasn't quite sure about the phlogiston idea, and he said nitrous oxide or deflogisticated nitrous air, but we won't go into that. He wrote to his mother, we are going on gloriously, this is about his work at the Pneumatic Institute, our palsied patients are getting better, and I am making discoveries every day. I have felt a more high degree of pleasure from breathing nitrous oxide than I have felt 
from any cause whatever. I said to myself, I was born to benefit the world by my talents. And the poet Southey write, Humphrey Davy possesses the most miraculous talents. He will do more for medicine than any person that has gone before him. Uh, and of course he didn't. He, he had it in his grasp almost to have the first anaesthetic and he didn't quite realise it. This is what he wrote after he'd been inhaling nitrous oxide himself. I won't read it through to you, but uh, it's one of his other poems. And he, he kept writing poetry for most of his life. And he's trying to describe the feeling of inhaling nitrous oxide. And I, I have to thank uh, Terry again for this cartoon. This is Humphrey Davy after he'd moved to the Royal Institution. You can just make it out on the door up there. It says Royal Institution. You probably can't read it. But he's, he gave public lectures, and they were well attended, particularly by young ladies who fell for him in a big way because he was a very handsome young man, and he was intelligent and interesting. And, and you can see a lot of the young ladies up the top here looking at what he's doing. And here's a man here who seems to be more interested in the young ladies. His lectures were so popular that the street where the Royal Institution was and still is, Albemarle Street, was the first one-way street in London. They had to control the traffic to stop the carriages getting jammed up with people going to Humphrey Davies' lectures. And they, I did read that Humphrey had found a powerful new formula, namely chemistry plus showmanship equals crowds and wonder and money. And of course these people paid to go in to see it. And this is another famous cartoon. Uh, the, the person inhaling the gas is not known, but this man was called Barnett. This is Humphrey Davy, quite recognisable here. And the man inhaling the gas is passing it out again through the seat of his trousers. And uh, Terry showed this picture yesterday at the U3A and someone said it's a very interesting chemical reaction to turn nitrous oxide into methane. Uh, but I wanted to just draw your attention to this man. This man was called Benjamin Thompson, who became known as Count Rumford. And he's standing there with his big, um, uh, what do you call it on the breast, the knighthood um, sort of medal. Um, he was an American, and um, he had moved to Bavaria for some reason or other, and it was a, 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 do, a you know do good sort of fellow. It, when I read once uh, that he was variously a professional soldier, an inventor, a man of science, a minister of state, a philanthropist, and a philanderer. But um, he was one of the people who established the Royal Institution along with Faraday and Banks. And uh, Faraday's another story, but um, Rumford was keen to in improve the diet of the poor and he made a thing called Rumford soup. And I believe you can still get uh, soup of that type in Bavaria today. In fact, I've had it somewhere. It wasn't particularly nice, but it was nice enough. <laughs> it's probably been modified a bit. And he created and gave to the city of Munich the Englischer Garten. It was called the English Garden in the center of Munich. Now, here's Humphrey Davy, fairly obviously, again. Uh, administering the laughing gas to a lady, and here's a lady who's obviously had it administered in a somewhat suggestive sort of pose there, but um, I just want to read a little bit uh, about what went on, not only at uh, Bristol at the Pneumatic Institute, but also at the, um, when he went to the Royal Institution in London. 19, uh, sorry, 1824, the Liverpool Mercury carried an article 
the singular effects produced by the respiration of nitrous oxide, referring to the experiments of Humphrey Davy and the effects of breathing the gas noted by Southey, Coleridge, Wedgwood, Lovell Edgeworth and others, quoted the experience of a correspondent who'd breathed the gas. The correspondent wrote, during the height of what may be termed the paroxysm, my sensations somewhat resembled those I have occasionally experienced when it has been my good fortune to come in for a share of superfine wine. What particular species of the juice of the grape in its effects the most resembles this laughing gas, I cannot now just determine, but if you or any of your friends are anxious to have the point settled, you have only to send me a few specimens of superior champagne or burgundy, and I will try and uh, work it out. And then later on in 1838, public exhibition of the properties of the gas at the lecture theatre at St Bartholomew's Hospital. The experiments were conducted by a Dr Elliotson. Dr Elliotson first allowed some medical students to inhale the gas and then my Lord Howick signified his wish to inhale the gas. He took a little which produced the most laughable effects on his Lordship. He laughed all out one side of his mouth and cut the most grotesque capers but the whole company got most alarmed when they saw his lordship take a newspaper out of his pocket, make it into a hat, and set fire to it and put it on his head. <laughs> Remonstrance was of no use. He ran about the room with the blazing headpiece until the cap burnt down to his own hair, which seemed to put a stop to his gambles. <laughs> and uh, Lord Melbourne was the next experimentalist. He was eyed with great interest by the whole company, especially the female part of it. He then suddenly began to run up and down the whole room in excitable state, offering to embrace all the ladies. So in that period, after nitrous oxide had become relatively readily available, people treated it as uh, a sort of entertainment. And there's lots of cartoons from the day, and I won't sort of delay too much on them, but here's another one. Here's another one that's probably Davy with the hat. Uh, another cartoon. And the, just sort of reflecting the sort of scenes that I've been describing. But people suddenly began to realise that what Dr Beddoes was doing down in Bristol was just giving people um, fun and hilarity and the hospital itself was rendered a bit ridiculous and uh, Beddoes um, uh, was sort of discredited really. And this is a paper that came out just in the New Zealand Medical Journal quite recently and I don't know if you know what that is but uh, I found that in the gutter and that is a cylinder of nitrous oxide and you can buy these for whipping cream. And um, this article in the New Zealand Medical Journal pointed out that uh, people were using nitrous oxide for pleasure, even nowadays. Um, and um, if you go to the supermarket and you find a canister of whipped cream and no one's looking, you can turn it upside down and only the nitrous oxide will come out. And then you put it back on the shelf and the person who buys it finds it doesn't work when they get it home. <laughs> Davy became an enthusiastically experimental with it, but he still didn't sort of grasp the possibility of it being an anaesthetic. Um, he would wander about at night with a big bag full of this gas. They didn't have it compressed into cylinders in those days, of course. Uh, but he would be writing poetry and staggering about and um, stopping anyone that came along and out, offering them to have some in inhalations of it. One night he drank a whole bottle of wine in eight minutes flat and then inhaled so much gas he passed out for a couple of hours and it still didn't dawn on him that this could be useful for surgery. <coughs> I might say that in his early days he would inhale anything that was inhalable and on many occasions nearly killed himself. He inhaled carbon monoxide until he passed out and was lucky he didn't die. He was ill for about a day after that. 
and he'd probably developed this neurological disease, which is a well-recognized phenomenon that's due to a complicated uh, metabolic disturbance caused by nitrous oxide if it's given for any length of time, any prolonged length of time. And I won't to dwell on it too much, but um, it can involve uh, neurological symptoms. And Davy suffered from these neurological symptoms, and it was probably only when he eventually got himself out of this addiction to nitrous oxide that he got better. Now, as you'd expect with a famous man, as he was, he's got a statue in Penzance. That's the back view looking down Market Dew Street. The statue is quite close to Borlase's pharmacy, Borlase's apothecary shop where he started his apothecary training. That's the front view of it with his miner's lamp. I'm not going to talk about the miner's lamp, but I'll show you one just as a little exhibit. <laughs> sort of looked roughly like that, except that it didn't have glass in it at all. This is a replica. This actually works if you put kerosene in it. Um, the Davy lamp, of course, had a platinum gauze uh, shield around the flame that prevented the heat of the flame igniting the methane in the mines. It was because of the lamp that he was knighted, and uh, he... He didn't marry for most of his life, and then uh, in the latter part of his life, he met a very wealthy widow called Jane Apris and uh, courted her for a while. She wasn't really interested until the possibility of her becoming Lady Davy, and then she agreed. And they, they were duly married, and he took her fishing, uh, along with his younger brother. That was their honeymoon. In, the, in Oxford, and like a lot of famous people, he's got a pub named after him. I don't, you can't see it very well, but it's the best picture I could get. The Humphrey Davy in Penzance, I think it is. I think it's Penzance. It might be Bristol. He travelled a lot. Uh, he became president of the Royal Society, as I've said, um, and he made this statement... Um, at one of his talks at the Royal Society, which I thought was probably quite nice, that uh, the, the philosopher, as they called themselves in those days rather than the scientist, should turn his endeavours to the advancement of science and not to the increase of his own reputation. And just before his death, he, they asked him what his greatest discovery was. He said, Michael Faraday, which was nice. He died on a holiday in... Uh, Switzerland, and there he's buried in a cemetery in Geneva. But anaesthesia was so close to being in his grasp, and 45, 50 years went by before it actually became a reality. Thank you. Yes. I'm intrigued by this romantic, the, the connection with the romantics. And uh, how did he get to know Coleridge and Southey? Well, good question. I, I don't know precisely, but they were um, prominent sort of people in their own right at that time. And they, they got to know the Pneumatic Institute. Um, I've missed out a few little bits and pieces along the way, and one of them I think you mentioned yesterday, Gregory Watt, the son of James Watt, was sent to the Pneumatic Institute to be treated for tuberculosis uh, unsuccessfully. He was a brilliant young man, but he died very young of the tuberculosis, as a lot of people did. Exactly how they, they met, I can't be sure, but uh, he was certainly influenced by them and they by him, uh, in terms of their poetry and so on, and he wrote poetry most of his life. Um, but uh, not sure whether who's, who sought out who. Yeah, thanks. Other questions? And the dates you had for the eight, 18th century, 
<clears throat> I'll suggest 1715, that's when the you know, orig origination of Allen and Hanbury's pharmaceutical, you know, what the really? makers of Ventolin and Zantac and what have you. So for, as you know, the doctor told us a few weeks <laughs> or a few months back that d d during that century, apothecaries were actually doctors. Yes. And yes. Allen and Hanbury's with you know, analytical chemistry, they created in, in time a new thing like pharmaceutical industry, but also the origination of chemistry, which Davy would have profited from. Then you had the lunatics, okay? <laughs> One of the, the doctor who, I, who noticed a patient not having died because of dropsy, the digitalis thing, foxglove, yes. can't remember the doctor's Withering. name. Withering, yeah. He was a member of that. Um, yes, yes. And maybe that's when observational medicine started. Yes. I don't know. Yes. William Withering well, yeah, uh, observed it. people treated with herbal remedies. One particular herbal remedy seemed to help their dropsy or, or ed edema from heart failure, and he found it was the foxglove. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, yes. Other questions? At the end of his life, he, f he fell out with, with Faraday, didn't he? I think possibly he was did it just a little jealousy, bit. Was it? Yes, yes. I mean, there's no doubt that Faraday uh, was um, a brilliant scientist, but in a different field, as you mentioned yesterday. And um, hard to say who was the greater of the two. But uh, in the latter part of his life, I understand Davy became rather irascible, and he was still pretty arrogant and still regarded himself as a genius. But for a genius, he missed something very important, and that's a shame. Yes. Any other questions? Well, once again, Mac, thank you very much indeed for a wonderful exposition. I really enjoyed that. So well, thank you. Could you all join me in congratulating Mac? Thank you. Thank you.